The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Hey, Jerry. There you are. There you hey, are. <laughs> What's up? All right, let's. You want to do it right now, right from this phone? Yeah, we can do it. We All right. To... I'm going to ta- take a beat. One, two, three. We are back. A's baseball, past, present, and future. I'm Ralph Tycho with the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. And here is the man, the myth, the legend, Jerry <laughs> Feidelberg. How are you, Jerry? Oh, that made my day. The man, the myth, and the legend. How about that? All in one sentence. All in <laughs> one sentence. We got a great A's team going. I mean, I wouldn't say great, but uh, totally overachievers and playing terrific ball. So um, Absolutely on the mark. You yeah. have nailed it. Yeah. Um, did Did you, in your wildest dream, expect five game, four or five games over five hundred at the halfway point in the season? No, I didn't. They're not, they're actually nine games over. They're forty eight and thirty nine. Oh, uh, oh. It's the best record. It's the best record since two thousand fourteen. Do you recall in two thousand and fourteen they had the best record in baseball? And then they traded Yoenna Cespedes to, the, to Boston for John Lester, and the team fell apart after that. They had, they had, they just barely made it into the playoffs and were eliminated by Kansas City. And of course, then they got rid of all their players, and the, the team has been lousy for three years. Now this year, it's it's unbelievably good. It was a joy to watch them play the two games against the San Diego Padres uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday. You know, it's really nice, the guy that we're rooting the hardest for because he's suffered so much this year, uh, Piscotti, whose mom tragically passed away of ALS. And yeah. um, what do you say about that? Um, he's developed into quite an offense and a defensive ball player. Yeah, we, I was talking about that earlier in the day. Uh, he reminds me of uh, his defense. Reminds me of Josh Reddick when he was with the A's. Yes, uh, he's very, very good. You can really depend on. Him. He's made some sensational plays in the outfield. And yesterday he had three doubles in the game and drove in three of the four runs. And he's very good with runners in scoring position. So he's he hits in the clutch. And so his batting average is maybe about two fifty five. But that doesn't show how good he is. He really is coming on strong. And, and his slow start was due to a couple of things. He was in a new league, new pitchers. He had to get used to them. Mm-hmm. And plus his mother's illness. Plus his mother's illness, which was weighing on him. And it, and as you know, uh, ALS is a terrible disease. There are no survivors. Anyone that has it, it's just a matter of time. So uh, for for Piscotti and the family, they had to get through that. Now he's back to playing baseball, and he's doing real well. Yeah. Um, I feel for him, and I uh, will always admire the way he stood up. And, um, you know, it's still fresh in his mind. It's not like it, uh, it's it been years. This is a no. few precious months. And, right. um, and he's concentrating enough on the field to do the job. I want to talk to you about attendance. Um, they came back after a terrific road trip. They were eight and two. They were playing Cleveland. First uh, first game, they drew fourteen thousand people. Did that improve over the weekend? Are, are people not really, not not really. I think they had uh, seventeen thousand on Sunday, Saturday, and Sunday. They didn't have great attendance. The Tuesday night game, they came in at 29,925, just a smidge under 30,000. And they were there for fireworks, the, the fireworks display that was going to be after the game. But it was, it reminded me of the way the Coliseum used to be in the 80s when the A's won the three uh, American League crowns mm-hmm. in 88, 89. And the players,
place was rocking. The A's were down two nothing, and then and in the uh, sixth inning they erupted for five runs, and the place was loud and raucous, and the players felt the crowd. And it has to be, I'm sure it made them feel good to be playing in full of a almost full house for the, for the A's and almost full house. Mm-hmm. And it, it was really nice. Uh, I enjoyed watching it. I, I really had a good time watching it and it felt good. And then yesterday on the 4th of July, and, and as a kid when in Boston, if you went to Fenway Park on the 4th of July, they used to have double headers, but now they don't do that anymore. But if you go to Boston on, on the 4th of July, it would always be a full house. Yesterday at the Coliseum, we had 14,400 people yeah. on a holiday. Very, very disappointing. Now, the fans that were there were good. You know, the A's were losing 2 nothing, and they, they scored a couple of runs, and Manaya pitched well. He went seven innings. He didn't get a decision, but when the A's uh, – in the eighth inning, they scored the two runs, and Piscotty had the bases loaded double, drove in two runs to put them ahead four to two. The cap, the, the fourteen thousand four hundred people that were there made a lot of noise, and yeah. that, that was fun. So, hey, not just was, because I'm a Mets fan and I can't stand to listen or watch them, um, they're good in their own right. I mean, I um, they're my team now in the American League, and they're fun to listen to. Um, yeah. Give kudos to Ken Korak, who is absolutely as good as anybody announcing in the Bay Area, and that says a lot. Let me tell you. Yeah, he he's got a great rhythm, and I told Ken uh, when when Ken was with Bill King many years ago, and I I was listening to him on the radio, and I I would tell them that every time I hear the game, it sounds like a brand new painting. These guys have, are great wordsmiths, and they describe the game, and they, they know when to get excited. They know when to shut up. They know – I've listened to some of the other games on uh, uh, on streaming radio. You get different cities. Some of these guys are monotones. They just – you fall asleep listening to them. Yeah. That will not happen with Korak. It you doesn't happen with Howie Rose, the Mets announcer, either, I might, I right. might add. But it does happen with a bunch of them. Korak, I've known for like 35 years now. Um, scares me how long, uh, long ago uh, it was and how fast time goes by. And um, he, he always had beyond, beyond just the great pipes. He had a way of speaking and still does whether you're speaking to him in person, where you're actually speaking to him. He's tuned in yeah. to you, and it sounds like he's talking to me on the radio, and that's the best compliment I can give an announcer if he can talk to you like he's your friend, like you're just talking ball, um, and he's that way, and it's a pleasure to listen, but it's got to be good ball or it gets old after a while, like with anything else. And it's been three three years now of total frustration. So this streak doesn't come from nowhere. Give Billy Bean a lot of credit. He's building this thing little by little. I'm just hoping we're not disappointed and they become sellers in July. Well, we'll see shortly. The, the trade that <coughs> uh, is on. Is uh, what four weeks away? Three, right. almost four weeks away. Right. There's and talk of keeping it, Lowry, and that that would be a big plus if they could could end up doing that. Chapman's back. Um, um, it, it. I mean, you might think on paper with Beretta being called up that um, they really don't have as much need for him, but I don't believe it for a minute. And um, unless they can do really well um, with with some well, prospects, but prospects are suspects, as as Michael Duca says, um, it's very yeah, difficult. They are. So let let's hope they can keep him just for the sake of continuity and uh, the clubhouse, the you know the um, intangibles. Uh, I like to call them, 
where we really can't uh, be objective about how much it means, just like we can't really be objective or um, subjective of uh, uh, objective about a manager or a coach in any sport and their effect. It's very difficult um, to pin down the effect. But Lowry is the kind of guy who's going to be good in the clubhouse, and I hope they keep yeah. up. That. Yeah, well, it's kind of kind of interesting with Lowry. Uh, the, the Jed uh, went back to Houston, I guess after his contract, up, so he got traded back to Houston. They held him for one year, and of course, you know, they had Jose Altuve, mm-hmm. and so they, they sent Jed back to Oakland, and he, I, he wasn't happy coming back here his first year. I think uh, last year he played, and he played well. He had 48 or 49 doubles, set a club record with doubles. Uh, but I didn't get the sense that he was, you know, he was doing what he had to do, but I don't think he had a rapport with the players. But I don't get that vibe this year. He's into it, and he's he's a team leader this year. He's, he's really enjoying his time in Oakland. And I think he's made it. Uh, quite clear that he wants to finish the year here. Right. So I, I think he has, he's had a change in his attitude. Great. He had injuries earlier in his career. And now that he's healthy, he's really showing how well he can play. He, he's going to be on the all-star team. I, I'd be very disappointed if he didn't. But you you brought up Matt Chapman. I have to tell you, that young man, he's 0, and 6, he's 0 for 6 since coming off the DL. Did you, are you going to talk about that that play he made in the infield the other day? In the sixth inning, he snared a, a Hunter Renfro, hit a blast going down the third baseline. They stat cast at it at 106-plus miles an hour. And he somehow speared it and started a 5-4-3 double play one of the best double plays ever by a third baseman. It was just lightning reflexes. I'd never seen anything like it. He stretched out and then caught, got the ball, and it was he somehow was in a throwing motion all in a split second. It was unbelievable. It really was. That was what I went, holy Toledo. That did I let me see that <laughs> on the, the instant replay one more time. <laughs> me, yeah. Wow, terrific saved, play! Saved the, saved a couple of runs, I think, because they're men on. Saved the run anyway. Yeah, nice. They've been playing good ball, and they're interesting, and they're um, they get a, a man who's getting a lot of credit. Where um, long overdue is Bob Melvin? That it's nice. Oh, yeah. yeah, he's doing a magnificent job. His starting rotation has been beat up. I can't remember so many guys on the DL. They've got they've got guys like Trevor Cahill, who, who when he pitched, pitched well. Brett Anderson, who didn't pitch so well. I, I have to but admit, they, they got those two guys around the same time. And yes. I, you could almost predict their whole careers. They both started with the A's. They went on to, uh, to other teams. And they were just injury injury ridden um all the way through and i have to say it was kind of a stretch getting them cahill pitched particularly well and i was yeah. hoping he wouldn't get hurt again but he did too and um yeah but he's kept it together and um it's it's yeah, a they, nice they, team and a fun team to watch yeah but now they got uh, manias pitching well they got they they uh, got uh, Edwin Jackson, who's pitched well, very well in two two starts. He beat Cleveland last week, and he's going up pitching on Saturday. Mingden's uh, hurt Frank too. Mingden. Mangden is hurt. Mangden is hurt. Triggs is hot. Hurt. Gossett is hurt. They got Bassett. Bassett pitched relatively well. Uh, he's one and three, but he's pitched fairly well. Uh, Paul Black Blackburn is two and two. Uh, mm-hmm. He beat Cleveland last week too, and he's pitching against uh, Carlos Carrasco Friday night. And uh, on Saturday, it will be Jackson going up against uh, the two-time Cy Young Award winner Corey Kluber, who's only 12 and four so far this season. So the the A's have their hands full because neither one of those two guys pitched last weekend here, 
when the A's took two out of three from Cleveland. Who would have, who'd have thunk we're in a spot where a wild card is not an impossibility? Well, right now the A's are seven games back of Seattle. If Seattle should falter, you know, it, does, it doesn't take much to, to pick up uh, seven games. And you don't have to do it all at once. They can pick up a, a couple games in July and a couple games in August and then a couple games in September, and then it's a one-game one lead, and anybody can, it's anybody's uh, race at that point. Absolutely. So all they have to do is keep playing good ball, and you know we don't know if Seattle's pitching is going to hold up. You just never know in baseball. So uh, let's hope that the A's can continue to do it. I know that they're, they're raising eyebrows all over Major League Baseball because this was the team that was picked to finish last again in the AL West, and they're not. They're in third place. They're four games ahead of the Angels, who were projected to finish ahead of them. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, it's always nice when the Giants and the A's are doing well. We hadn't had the A's doing well for a while. Who'd have thunk that both teams would be over 500? When I said four games, I, I think the Giants are four games over. That's what I was thinking yeah. in my mind. Um, yeah, that's the, pretty cool. The Giants, had, the Giants had a they did okay in Arizona, and then they went to Colorado for three, and they they lost all three in Colorado. But this, they're getting uh, Cueto and Samarja back, and uh, hopefully, the, if Cueto has anything left in the tank, he can help them. Samarja, at best, has just been a is sub slightly under five hundred career pitcher. Uh, I right. think he's been over high all, all these years, and Bumgarner's been coming back. So they got their three guys, and uh, Stratton, whoever else is pitching, Suarez. The, uh, Suarez has the been a, a big surprise coming up. Um, nice. Nice that both teams yeah. are doing well at the same time. And before we close it, I want to talk about one of the most underrated Pitches for some reason, he doesn't have a blazing fastball. As a closer, he doesn't stand out only in the sense that this guy is like, they're like 30 for 30, 31 for 31 after they've had the lead for seven innings. Their closer, Tree, Treehan. Uh, oh, Blake Trump? Yeah. Oh, he, he, he's been he terrific. Throw, he throws it. He throws it up 98 miles an hour. He he had it going yesterday. He he is he has converted all 19 of his last save opportunities. He's 22 for 24. He he's converted 19 since May 4th. He's just lights out when he comes in. And the the A's brought up a rookie by the name of Lou Trevino, who's seven and one. Trevino wasn't on wasn't wasn't uh, in the uh, made the club at the begin at the end of spring training. They brought him up, and he has been outstanding as the setup guy. Mm-hmm. So the 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 other the other relievers that they have, uh, 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 Ismael Petit, uh, Santiago Casilla, uh, Chris Hatcher, uh, the lefty. Uh, they have Ryan Butcher. They all have been coming through and pitching well. And this is this is really very important in the A's success because the starters have have gone on the DL. They, these guys need to come through for them, and they have been. Yeah. So uh, and Melvin and Melvin and uh, has been doing a masterful job matching up the players and the lineups and the, and using the using the pitchers and figure out who's going to do what against whom and. Uh, Boy, is he ever earning his money this year? Wow. Well, Absolutely. He's probably underpaid. He's probably underpaid, too. Yeah, well, if you can be and have anything, if you can be underpaid and have anything to do with Major League Baseball, you got a scoop. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, oh, yeah. there's more money going around than, um, than you could shake a stick at. And um, in a way, you got to like it. In a way, it's uh, it's very scary what it's become, but it is what it is, and uh, yeah. I I like that we're in the game. I want to ask you 
Is there any buzz about a stadium, anything about, you know, what the decision is? I know they're keeping it pretty close to the vest. They they kind of uh, uh, took steps, uh, made, you know, before really getting their their uh, their cards in in order um, on the Peralta thing. What, what do you think? What's your gut position on this? What do you think will happen? You, your gut feeling? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And, and we've discussed this, and I've given it a lot of thought. No one is asking a Dave Cavill or, or anybody about the stadium. We know that they've promised to make an announcement by the end of the, the year, whether it's the baseball season year or the end of the calendar year. We don't know. They, they were embarrassed last year by the, what happened at Laney College. If you recall, they made a, they made a big splash about how they were going to take the parking lot at Laney. And they thought they had all their ducks in a row, only to have the apple cart get upset by the board of trustees because the trustees listened to the students and the faculty who didn't want the baseball stadium. And they, they scuttled the deal. So they left the two choices, Howard Terminal and the, the current location at Coliseum. The Howard Terminal is in mostly an industrial area. It's where the, it's where the uh, container ships come in and they load and unload their containers. There's nothing around it. other than It's close to Jack London Square, but not close enough. The, the current location, the Oakland Coliseum, uh, I'm sure the A's, the A's would have to play someone where, play somewhere for a couple of years while the stadium was being built. They could probably stay in the current building while they build it, or maybe if they were lucky, they could work out a deal with the Giants and play their games over there for the two years it's being built. I would have thought but, that if that was going to happen, I would have thought that was going to happen years ago. I yeah, thought I so, thought it was yeah. a great idea. Um, Giants were financing it independently, and they went out on the hook. It took them a long time to recover. Uh, they had a big loan going out, and they made it work by winning. So I Yeah, well, the, the giant situation is they, they stayed in Candlestick Park until the stadium was built, and then they moved out. The A's would have, could, they could stay, stay in the Coliseum, but the, it was, the construction would be in the and right it's in the parking lots and you might you know, where are you gonna put the cars when for the two years it's being built. They'd have to, to work out something. It could well what the Mets do. The well the Mets built uh, a city field right next to Shea Stadium. Same thing. Same thing. Yeah. All right. And the Yankees built the Yankees and the Yankees built the new Yankee Stadium right next to the old one. Right. So it, was, it can be was, done at Go ahead. There was never any parking at. There was never that much parking at Yankee Stadium. You, you, everyone took the subway up to Yankee Stadium. Right. Right. Yeah. So, and, and public transportation is so good in New York. It's unbelievable. Well, it you get Bart going a little there. bit, and you know Bart holds it over. You take Bart to a, a game, and they stop running after a certain amount. You get extra innings. You could be stranded. Yeah, it stops at midnight. Yeah. So New York runs, New York runs all night long. Absolutely, and that it's makes just, it... It's just different. Different city. Yes, indeed. Different city. All right, Jerry. Thank you so yeah. much, my friend, and um, we'll do another one uh, very shortly. Yeah, it was a great discussion. I, I, I really enjoyed watching the team play yesterday. Uh, it was a great game. Both teams pitched well. Uh, the Padres had it going. Uh, they couldn't score. The A's pitching escaped a couple jams when they had to. And uh, it's the way baseball should be played. And then when the A's scored the runs in the eighth inning, the fans were delighted. Same thing in the, on the Wednesday night game. It was just good baseball. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm watching... Uh, um a re- what was it? It was it was a Dodger World Series game, and um, 
and Vince Scully. Dis- it was a Red Sox game, as a matter of fact, and they're playing in the National League. And Vince Scully says, describes uh, Jim Rice as the designated sitter because <laughs> they were playing in the <laughs> playing in the National League. And I thought that was uh, a tremendous idea. And you mentioned it was great baseball, right? It's not really great baseball. Actually, DH is kind of a bastardized version of the way the game used to be played when we were kids. And you had to come to the ballpark with a glove and a bat. It was just that simple. Yeah. Um, but I, I, will, I will remind you, you still have to get 27 outs. And having to face the DH four times in a game makes it a lot tougher for the pitchers. Yes, absolutely makes it a lot tougher for the pitchers and a lot more boring because of the lack of strategy, whether to take out the pitcher, pinch hit for the pitcher, that sort of thing. Uh, Yeah, I give you that. And and we can enjoy both. And you can enjoy both. But I think, and I'm scared to say this, within five years... Um, there won't be a, there will be a designated hitter in the National League. Let's put it that way. It's just yeah, I think if the American, I think if the American League did away with the DH one back to baseball the way it was, they'd have a ruckus with the players union. That's exactly and, right. Yeah. And that's what's going to win the, the day for the DH in the National League. He, he, yeah. They'd be giving up, and they are now, they're giving up. Among, amongst the highest ranked players by money, by position, in as a DH. Um, so it's not going to happen. It, or it's, it's going to happen, one or the other. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. anyway, it's been great talking baseball with you today. And it, it, is still is, it still is baseball, as you say, uh, bastardized as, as it is. It's a bat, a ball, and as you pointed out, you got to get 27 outs. No matter how you slice it, all right, you got to do it. Stay healthy, okay. my friend, and we'll talk soon. And okay, I want to, Jerry Feidelberg, former A's pharmacist, by the way. So uh, if you're thinking, should I get Advil? Should I get Bayer aspirin? <laughs> You could ask Jerry. He's available on Facebook. You ask him. You say, what's the best? He'll tell you. Thanks, Jerry. Sure. <laughs> All right. The best is what it works. Whatever works is the best. That's exactly right. Uh, I, actually, the placebo is the very best when it comes there to There you it. go. All right. Be well, my friend. Okay. Take care. Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, Comfortably Zone Radio Network. He's baseball, past, present, future. I'm Ralph Tycho. I had the pleasure of talking to Jerry Feidelberg. Adios, everybody. Take care.